So welcome, Nicholas. We are really excited to have you for today's podcast episode. And um, I always start off with the first question being the most basic, which is just introducing yourself and explaining to our listeners what you do. Sure. I'm, I'm very basic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I was actually born in, in Germany originally. I moved to the US in 2011. In Germany, I used to play primarily golf. I was a national player and then decided to not turn pro, but instead I studied computer science and finance. Um, and then I moved to the U.S. to pursue my MBA. I went to Stanford, graduated in 2013. And that's when, when the fun began. When I started my first company, we wanted to build something like Amazon for used cars. So we were selling used cars online. Uh, we raised money from first investors and other um, professors and lecturers, went through the startup accelerator program, Y Combinator, and we can talk about more in, in a second. Then we raised institutional money. We raised a total of $10 million in the end. And in 2017, uh, four years after starting the business, we sold the business to Carvana. And Carvana, you might know, it's the business with these huge car vending machines um, growing really, really fast. Mm -hmm. We stayed there for three years. My co-founder and I just left to start a new business. This time it's a digital platform to refinance auto loans. And we can go into all of that more if you want to. Definitely. Um, just closed our seat round and now now off to the races again. Awesome. Um, yeah, I definitely have like a ton of questions. <laughs> um, the first one being, what made you get into the auto or car industry, yeah. especially with you having a background in golf and then computers? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I ask myself that question every day. <laughs> um, Chris, my co-founder, is a huge, huge car enthusiast. His first car was a DeLorean. Uh, do you know that? That's the one yes. from Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah. And so he, he had a funny deal with his parents. His parents said they'll get him a car. He has a budget of $5,000. And they thought he'd buy the best and like safest and most uh, affordable car for $5,000 possible. But he did the opposite. He looked on Craigslist for mm -hmm. years, literally. He started when he was 14 for the most obnoxious car he could find for $5,000. And so he, he found this wrecked uh, DeLorean. Uh, his dad is a like a handy, crafty man and said, okay, let's just buy this and try to get it fixed until the year turned 16. By the time he was 16, it was driving, and so that was his first car. And then later on, he wanted to actually work for a Formula One company, either Ferrari or McLaren. That was just his dream. He was a mechanical engineer, went to MIT undergrad, and wanted to be like a, a Formula One engineer. Ended up working for McLaren in, in the UK. Uh, loved the product, but really didn't like the company. And so I talked him into starting a business in the car space. Okay. And then how okay. did you get involved with that too? Like, do you have any type of background interest yeah. in cars? Um, so when, when we, towards the end of business school, I, I really wanted to start a company. Part of the reason why I came to the US was to figure out how to get into tech, start a company. Um, and I was like desperately looking for ideas while at Stanford. And in the beginning, I actually thought about ideas in the golf space or something um, tangential. And then towards the end of business school, when Chris, we became really good friends and I hung out more and more and more, all of a sudden, all our classmates approached him with one and the same question. They asked him, hey, how do I sell a used car? And Chris gave a little bit of advice. And then all our classmates, and this is typical MBA student, well, I'm busy. Can you sell my car for me? <laughs> and we jokingly said, well, if you pay us for it, we'll do it. And then people said, sure, how much do you want? And we're like, oh, that's interesting. And so the, when you start a business, the first months, quarters, years are all about finding value, finding something that people want to pay for. And since I wanted to start a company and, and Chris got really excited about the opportunity too, we said, well, let's see, let's see what happens if we sell cars. Like, are we providing value? Will people refer us to other friends and other people? And so we started out by selling our classmates' cars. And then we sold, by, by the time we graduated, we probably sold 50 cars or so. We detailed them, took photos, went on test drives, and, and thought that was a really terrible experience <laughs> and wanted to figure out how we can use technology to make it better. That's really awesome. I would have never yeah. thought to do that as a college <laughs> student, um, especially well, like you were saying, everyone having to balance their schedules too. Yeah. Well, that's what they say. <laughs> In reality, <laughs> they just wanted to party. You need to understand business school students, like the average, this is not me telling you my salary, but if you look at the stats, you can find it. The, I think the average Stanford student, Stanford MBA makes $165,000 post-graduation. 
Um, and so we were detailing cars and washing cars. So we, we clearly went a very different direction. <laughs> it, it worked out really well for us, luckily. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. main reason why we, why we wanted to start a company was not to make money. We wanted to just make a difference and be impactful, which I think is really important when you start a company. But yeah, like people were busy partying while we were selling cars. So I have some kind of bigger picture questions. Um, okay, let's do it. So stuff like, you know, what advice do you have for like new entrepreneurs out there who maybe, you know, are kind of like where you were like back in business school? Yeah, uh, I think that's a really good question. So new entrepreneurs, there's two types of people. I think there's people who are really passionate about a specific vertical, like Chris loves cars. There's others who love food, others who love, I don't know cybersecurity for some reason like there's the, the most extreme ends so that the one type archetype of entrepreneur is somebody who loves a vertical and then the other one is more a generalist this is much more me we're like i'm not particularly mm -hmm. passionate about a certain vertical like i could have i could have started a plane company or car company i just want to solve really really interesting problems and i want to make sure if, if i spent my time on something it impacts a lot of other people and so this was actually my struggle at business school. I just couldn't find, like I was forcing myself to find that vertical. And other than golf, mm -hmm. it's, I wasn't authentic to any other space. I wasn't an expert in anything but golf. And so I needed to understand and learn that lesson myself. I actually gave a talk about that at Stanford. It was like a TED talk where I talked about, if you're, if you're like me, you will never find that passion yourself. Instead, team up with other people who have this vertical expertise or really authentic in a certain space be the guy that enables them. And so that's ended, what ended up happening for me, Chris, super vertically deep, deep, deep understanding. And I just helped him make it a business. And now over the years, I learned so much in the car space and in the financing space that now I'm somewhat authentic to the auto loan space. And so I really understand it. Now I'm really passionate because I think it's, it's messed up. It needs to be fixed. But my advice to entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, or wannabe entrepreneurs is figure out which one are you? Are you the one who is very passionate about a space? Or are you the generalist like me? And then go about it in the respective way. If you're passionate about a certain space, figure out who can help you make it happen. Or if you're more of a generalist, well, find that guy who's really passionate about a certain vertical and then team up with that person. That's really good advice. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely identify with that. I'm very like breadth not depth yep. kind of a person like very broad brushed as well and that's so. okay like it, it works out still <laughs> yeah you just need to it took me long to realize and understand and i was forcing myself to be somebody who i'm not um mm -hmm. and so yeah my advice would be just just find people there's so many people like artists are the best example actually because they're they're really passionate about a specific thing they're doing they'll just never make it a business and mm -hmm. if you're if you have like a broader skill skill set you're like a gift sent from heaven for these type of people because they wouldn't know what to do tomorrow to get it started. That's yeah. really good advice, especially because I feel like we do have a range of students that come into Fast Forward U and some of them are like, they know exactly what they want to work in, whatever space niche that they have. And then there are others who are like, I don't even know, I don't have a business idea. I just yeah. know that I want to help a startup. Yeah. Um, so that's really awesome because I don't think we've ever really spoken to anyone who's had this more broad guidance where it's like, it's okay if you don't have a one stint yeah. that you go to. The reason why I don't think you've come across a lot of people like that is because the obvious entrepreneurs are the ones who are really deeply passionate about a space. If, if, in order to be the CEO of a startup, you really need to be passionate about the space. Like you need to speak that voice, even if things are not going well, which all the time they don't go well until they go well. <laughs> you still need to be in it for the right reason, be excited about what you're doing. And so often you see the founders who run their companies to be like the one who's passionate about the vertical. Rarely do you see the generalist being the one in the lead, if that makes sense. Definitely. And um, going a little backward, you mentioned that you were in Y Combinator. Yep. How was that experience for you? And how did you feel like going through a program like that helped you yep. in the long run? So we got really lucky because as part of our Stanford experience, we just met really incredible professors and lecturers. When, when Chris and I were selling these cars, we didn't think about making this a business. Like it was more of a summer project. Even, even his mother, after we raised $1.2 million, I think, kept calling him and was like, okay, so when are you done with your summer project? And when are you <laughs> gonna find a job? So it wasn't that obvious in the beginning that this was going to be a business. 
I sought advice from a, a man I respect a lot and I, I'm lucky to call my mentor, Andy Rackleff. He started Wealthfront and he was a venture capitalist. He started the fund that invested in Uber and Snapchat, for example. And so we spent an hour having lunch and grabbing a beer. And then he said, I'm, I'm sorry, I need to leave, but I think you already made your decision for the last 55 out of the 60 minutes, all you talked about was selling cars. I think you should make that a business. And if you want to make this a business, here's $50,000 to get started. And so this is, this is very unique to Stanford where the professors and lecturers are entrepreneurs themselves willing to give back and supporting us. Um, and as a result, we were able to raise $1.2 million in seed funding. And then we ran our company for half a year and we felt like we weren't growing fast enough. When you run a venture, venture scale business, you need to really exponentially grow. And we decided that we would join Y Combinator because all, all we've heard about was Y Combinator was you get a lot of support to produce growth and you have a team or a group or peers keeping you accountable. And so what we found is within our group, like you have office hours where you meet on a biweekly basis with other teams, everybody always gave an update. And so the updates were, hey, I deployed my app to the app store, it's live, or hey, I trusted out a few designs, conversion approved. And then when we spoke, the story was always like, so we sold 39 cars, made $390,000 in revenue, one person stole a car, so we needed to chase them on the highway, and another one paid with a forged check. <laughs> and so every time we gave our updates, the whole room was silent looking at us because we had all these crazy stories that happened to us. And then luckily, thanks to these stories, a lot of, of the YC partners fell in love with like our hustle and then ended up investing in us. Uh, but what I, the reason I'm telling that is because YC wants you to become that person, and I feel like we already were that person. Like we already were this founder that hustled a lot. We got very different things out of it. We met, met, met a lot of other peers and founders and built a really, really great network in Silicon Valley that till this day, I'm, I'm lucky to call my friends. Um, and so that's what I got out of it. Most companies get somebody like a little bit adult supervision and producing growth and helping you how to think about growth. And that's why it's a really good idea to do it as a first time founder. Out of curiosity, what's the craziest thing that happened in those 40 years? <laughs> a lot of crazy things. So when, <laughs> when we were still doing peer-to-peer, -peer, the model changed over time. But when we did peer-to-peer, -peer, I would let Eric, I would help Erica sell her car to somebody else. And then uh, this other person would come and we would let them test drive by themselves. We would spy it by an ID, test drive, and we would remotely control them, or not control them, track them. So we'd know where the cars are. And so one time this person test drove and test drove in the beginning, it was still responsive. And then he just stopped talking to us. And I, Chris was at a wedding and like after four hours of this guy test driving, I could track him. I knew exactly where he was. He wasn't communicating. I called Chris, my girlfriend. I was like, remember when we once talked about maybe somebody will steal a car one day? He's like, yeah, I think that day is today. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> we couldn't reach this person anymore. Uh, and then it became late and it was a Friday afternoon or evening. The, par the car was parked somewhere an hour and a half south of where we were. I went home and then the next morning, since the car was still the same spot, I grabbed our first employee, Brendan, and told them, hey, what if we drive there and try to find the car? So we drove there and then by the time we arrived, it was gone, but we could see it was somewhere else. And so we drove around and all of a sudden he was passing us, like the thief was passing us in our own car. So you're driving behind it and ask yourself, so what do we do now? And then Brendan called the cops and said, hey, somebody stole a car and this guy's driving right in front of us. And the cops like, like, great, we'll help you. What's your name and what's the license plate? So we gave him that. It's like, well, that doesn't match. You're not the legal owner of the vehicle. We're like, no, we're helping the legal owner sell it. The cops like, yeah, but you can't report the car stolen if it's not your car. We're like, but it's stolen, it's in front of us. Like, we can't intervene, you need to call the owner. And we're like, oh, we can't reach him, he's abroad. He's like, yeah, I can't help. And I'm like, what, what if I just hit the car a little bit and then cause a little tiny accident, then the cops need to come and clarify and then you'll find out he stole the car. He's like, yeah, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then lucky, luckily I didn't produce an accident. We stopped chasing him because we knew where he lived and we knew where he worked. And then the next day we, we bought the stolen car from the previous owner. So we paid him, we said, good news, bad news, good news, here's your money, bad news, it's actually stolen. So we're reporting it stolen. And then on Monday, the cops went and impounded it. On Tuesday, we had it back. Well, that's that's wild. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not what you envision, but um, 
these things happen. What would you say out of your entire time so far being an entrepreneur is the best thing and the worst thing? Um, this is a good question. When in my previous job, so before we sold the company, there's like entrepreneurship is this roller coaster where one day you're excited because you had a good meeting, next day you're devastated because a customer canceled or whatever. So it goes up and down all the time. And there were phases when it wasn't going very well for a long time. And people asked me, so do you really enjoy what you're doing? And I always tell, told them, I hate what I'm doing, but I wouldn't want to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and so entrepreneurship or being a founder really means that you become, you and the company become one. So your whole personality and your identity is this company. And so when things are going well, it feels great. Obviously, you're so proud and you're having impact. And customers are thankful and grateful and you're creating good experiences. And when things are not going well, it's very hard to distance yourself. Um, yet that's just something you need to learn over time. Um, you need to take breaks. You need to go for a run. You need to sleep long. You need to get a lot of sleep. You need mentors and coaches help you because uh, it's just a really big burden you're carrying. And so, yeah, the best thing is the highs you get when you create good experiences for your customers. The, the worst thing is when, when you feel like things are not going and you take it incredibly personally. You spoke about the digital space. So I wanted to ask, have you now been impacted in any way by COVID or do you feel like you have somewhat of an advantage because you guys are doing, you're in the auto industry, but it is something that relies on digital already. Do you feel like that kind of put yeah. you in an advantage? Yeah, so this COVID thing, it, it's this two-edged sword where it's terrible for a lot of people and insanely positive for a lot of other people. The people benefiting from it are people in tech. Um, it's no surprise to me that Amazon doubled its market valuation to almost $2 trillion over the last three months because people start buying online. But in the car space, two things happen. If, if you're the only one who sells cars online successfully and has a great experience, you benefit. And then since more people are buying cars now because they avoid public transport, like demand for cars is an all-time high. And so I happen to be on the side of the fans that massively benefits from, from the implication of COVID. When you can look at the Carvana stock price, when we sold our company, we were paid in stock of Carvana. Before we went public, the company went public at $15 and now the share price is above 200. Um, and so whatever we had and agreed on is now a lot more. So I, I got lucky and I'm on the side of, of the fence that benefits hugely, but I, th I think we should still acknowledge that there's a lot of businesses that are struggling. So I got lucky. What was the experience like of like actually selling your business? Um, this is a good question. So you don't start a business to sell it. Like you start a business in order to take it public and like dominate the space. There's a good book by Peter Thiel, who's one of the early PayPal employees and founders and early investor in Facebook and has a huge fund now. It's like an incredible person. And he explains that when you start a company, what you're striving for is to build a monopoly. Like you want to have a dominated space and that could be because you have a secret sauce because of product or because you have all the customers. Like Facebook, for example, has all the customers. So every time they launch a product, very easy to find distribution because they hop um, and then Facebook is really good at protecting that by adding Instagram, by adding WhatsApp. Um, and so when we started our company, our goal was to ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange and become the biggest car retail in the country. Our problem was we had, we had two structural disadvantages. Number one is we thought we'd build a tech company, but we realized we needed to invest a lot in physical infra infrastructure. So we needed reconditioning centers and logistics. We underestimated that when we got into the market. And the second problem was we more than well, almost seventy percent of Americans don't have prime credit. That means they have credit scores below seven hundred. And in order to help them buy a car, they need loans. And in order to give them loans, you need to have a lot of history in the car space. Otherwise, the lenders don't work with you. And it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. You can't get big without lenders, but the lenders won't work with you unless you're big. And so that second hurdle was very hard for us to overcome. Whereas uh, it was a fully integrated business, the father of the founder of Carvana, uh, one of the in the country, owns it, and it's, it's specialized on people with and uh, customers with challenged credit. So they were able to lend to the, the the majority of the population that we couldn't serve. 
Um, and so for us, that meant to ask ourselves, what do we want? Do we want to be building a small good business or do we want to build a big great business? And instead of raising more money, we decided to go on board with Corvana. We became friends and really close to the founders and executives over there and realized that A, our missions are totally aligned. B, we, we would have been friends had we met earlier and see the two businesses were very complementary. Ours was something they wanted to build and this was just a, a way to accelerate progress for them. And that's why it made a lot of sense. And then we got lucky to, to also be able to stay on for three years, be impactful and see it through. Now I feel like I started a business and then I changed lanes and then I continued. And so I had the full experience and full journey. Um, but the next time I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be the company buying other companies. <laughs> Awesome. And my last question for you is sure. what links, websites, pages would you want our listeners to access in order to keep up with you? <laughs> sure. So I, I, I love staying in touch. I love giving back. A lot of people help me get to where I am. And so if, if that's the least I can do, I'd love for, for people from your program and your network to reach out to me. I do on, on LinkedIn. Uh, just look for Nicholas Hendrickson. I would put the, the link into the show notes. And the, the new business we're working on is called Clutch. The domain is withclutch.com, and it's a digital platform to refinance your auto loans. Most Americans are overpaying on their auto loans and don't know, and so we're creating a really easy progress uh, process for you to save a lot of money. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nick. It's been really nice talking to you. Um, you've had such great advice yeah. during the past Seriously. 30 minutes, um, and as always, like I said before, we will definitely post your links in the description of this podcast. Awesome. And um, I would love to stay in contact with you and throughout Fast Forward to Use journey. It's been really nice. Thanks for reaching sure. out. Sure. Yeah, no, no, yeah, I'm glad so I reached much. out. You guys are awesome. Yeah.